evening. My name is Mike Formby, and I'm the chair of the Heart Board Project Oversight Committee, and I want to welcome everyone to tonight's meeting. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to attend. Before we get started, because we're on Olalo, I want to introduce the other board members that are members of the Project Oversight Committee. Seated to my left is Heart Board Chair and former Congresswoman Colleen Hanabusa. Seated to my right, Heart Board Vice Chair Damian Kim. Mm -hmm. Seated to Damian's right is Heart Board Member Buzzy Hong. And seated to the far left is Heart Board Member Ivan Louis Kwan. So this is the first time, to my knowledge, that Hart has held an evening meeting of a, of a board committee. And traditionally, we have our meetings midday on a weekday. And we're really doing this as a test case to see whether or not the public has an interest in coming to these meetings, whether it's in person or watching over Olelo. So I appreciate you coming tonight. And I appreciate MOCA, the Mayor's Office of Culture and Arts, for making this facility available. The staff was amenable to, to opening up tonight for this special occasion. So this is not a general heart board meeting. I don't want to make, it, make sure everybody understands that. If you look at the agenda, it is very focused. We're basically look, looking at utilities and their relocation. And in addition, we're looking at the anticipated effect of construction in the city center section. So it's a focused project oversight committee meeting. So for the purposes of the public testimony, I would like you to try to keep your comments focused to the purpose of this meeting. And our board administrator, Cindy Matsushita, will be timing you. You will have three minutes when you hear the buzzer go off. Two minutes, I'm sorry. Two minutes when you hear the buzzer go off. Please try to bring your comments to a close. So Cindy, the names that I have here, are these the only two names that have signed up so far? Okay, so if you would like to speak, please Go to Cindy and fill out a form and put your name on it. But first, I'll call up Roy Nakamura. Good evening. You know, before the hot board even went forward on this project, how come they never get all the electrical lines all included with the project? How come only now when they almost reach Imperial City, they're coming across all these obstacles? Now, there's two ways how to do it. Either knock the whole thing down, go to be cheaper, or met like. Because if you go on a heavy rail, the grounds are soft. The train's not gonna last. Now you go even further toward Moanalua Valley, where Mapuna Puna is. The hot uh, map was shown at Kali Kai uh, Elementary School was bogus. Above the Moanalua Highway is a flood zone risk, not below the rail, close to the Kei Lagoon. So you folks going to come across more problems. So why go any further? Why not knock the whole thing down, be cheaper for all the taxpayers? The property taxpayers gonna pay the biggest price in Honolulu. So if you folks gonna consider this project to go any further, where the money gonna come from? I hope it's not coming from us. We're already in low income housing. The next step is homeless. So if you folks wanna really do something good for the public, knock the whole thing down cheaper. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nakamura. Board members, any questions? Seeing none, our next testifier is Natalie Iwasa. Thank you. Thank you for holding this meeting here tonight and making arrangements for the parking out there. Um, since this is just focused on the utility relocation, I just wanted to ask um, that part of your discussion be, uh, what is the status of the um, Davis-Bacon um, wage issue with respect to HECO? Um, you know, with res the relocation, we're looking at um, potentially huge costs, but there's also the Davis-Bacon, and I don't know if anybody has really put a number on that yet. Um, so. I'd be interested in hearing that. And then I look forward to your future meetings and I'll bring up some other issues on the finances. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie, I appreciate that. 
Board members, any questions? Seeing none, is there anybody else that would like to testify tonight? If so, please come up to the microphone. Great, thank you. So next on the agenda is a presentation by Brennan Morioka, the Deputy Executive Director, and it is a discussion on utility relocation and construction impacts in the city center section. So Brennan, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Chair Formby, uh, members of the Project Oversight Committee. Brendan Morioka on behalf of HART. Um, appreciate the opportunity to give a, a, a fairly high level briefing on the complexities of the utility relocation efforts that's going to be uh, done in the city center area. More specifically, uh, I have some examples and, and some uh, educational stuff on Dillingham Boulevard specifically, but I'm going to go over kind of a, a very general description of some of the utility issues along the entire city center corridor, uh, and then we'll wrap it up with some uh, of the aspects of traffic that we're going to have to be looking at in terms of how construction can impact the network of roads uh, along the corridor as well. And Brennan, if you don't mind, because, you know, having reviewed your, your uh, PowerPoint in advance, because some of it is quite specific and detailed. Do you mind if the board members are able to ask questions as you go through the PowerPoint sure. versus saving them all for the end? Is that Absolutely. Okay. okay. So first, um, just a very brief overview of the, I guess, volume of utilities that are going to be handled as a part of the city center project. Uh, we are dealing with a wide variety of utilities. Uh, electrical, communication lines, street lighting, water, drainage, sewer, gas. So all your basic uh, utilities along uh, a roadway that you would normally find in most roadway projects. <clears throat> the city center project alone has the largest amount of utility relocations amongst all three of our segments uh, put together. Uh, if you just look at the linear feet of electrical and communication lines as well as street lighting, uh, cables and the water lines and drainage, we are talking about a significant amount of linear footage. And again, it's not that, that uh, they're all over the place in multiple conduits. Uh, many, in, in, in many instances, they are in the same conduit. It's just it is multiple lines within the same conduit. So that is how we uh, delineate some of the linear footage. So it is quite a, a volume of utilities. Uh, and these are just some photos of the types of utility work that is incorporated as a part of, of utility relocations, whether it's trenching, uh, overhead work, heavy equipment, that kind of stuff. Okay, Brennan, a question? Yes. Brennan, if, um, I mean, we know, because we talk about this and we live this, what city center is. But for those who are tuning in, can you please explain, when we're talking about 130,000 linear feet of electrical communications and city center where does it start and where does it end sure and i have a few slides that kind of yes. show aerials of the corridor and i broke it up into a little bit phases so we can talk also uh the types of utilities that are prevalent in those specific regions um, so but in general city center uh the corridor starts at the middle middle street transit center on dillingham boulevard goes down dillingham all the way past uh costco Honolulu Community College to Ka'ahi Street, which is just past Costco on the Diamond Head side by the Ivalay substation. And then it continues on to uh, Nimitz Highway by the Chinatown area, continues past downtown by Aloha Tower, and then on to Halikuila by the uh, Federal Building, down Halikuila until we hit Ward Avenue, where we then cross over right at Ward Avenue uh, through the Rosses, uh, and then we get on to Queen Street. We continue down Queen Street to Waimano, and where we also then also cross over onto Kona Street, and we end at, um, we cross P.E. Koi, and then we end on Kona Street at Ala Moana Shopping Center. And so I do have some aerial photos that kind of show the, the corridor. So Brennan, on, on this first slide, the linear feet that you show, this is for the entire project? This is not just City Center, correct? This is just for City Center. Just for City Center. Just for City Center. Thank you. We have a whole separate slide for airports if you want to have a separate presentation on that. Too. Okay, thank you. Okay, so the Dillingham corridor, we'll start, I'll start on the east and work to the west. So 
on the EVA side, where we start at Middle Street Transit Center. Uh, this area shows the Dillingham corridor all the way to the Ivalay uh, Station on Ka'ahi Street, where we primarily have, uh, and again, we have the full menu of utilities, whether it's drainage, water, sewer, electric, uh, gas, and uh, your fiber optics, whether it's AT&T, Hawaiian Telecom, Oceanic, Time Warner Cable. And then we have a whole different variety of sizes of pipes, of both sewer, drainage, water. In the Kaka'ako corridor, which basically goes from uh, the Chinatown station or Ivale station to the Civic Center station, uh, again, we have a whole variety of, of uh, utility lines. Uh, it does differ, again, a little bit in terms of the types and the sizes of utilities, whether it's drainage, where we go up to a 40-inch uh, drainage line, a 30-inch sewer line, a uh, little smaller uh, distribution water lines, electric, gas, Hawaiian Telecom, Oceanic, Time Warner Cable. Uh, the biggest thing here, if you notice, compared to the Dillingham Corridor, uh, the el electrical work is much uh, less significant because we, we are not dealing with the 138s in this area. And then we continue further, wet, uh, further east um, between the Civic Center Station in Kaka'ako, the Kaka'ako Station, and the ending at Ala Moana Center. Uh, again, a variety of utilities, drainage, 36-inch uh, and 24-inch drainage lines, water lines, uh, sewer connections, electrical lines, gas, Hawaiian Telecom, and Oceanic Time Warner Cable. And again, this area also does not include a 138 kV uh, line that we are going to have to deal with. Okay. Any questions on the corridor? No, but Brennan, I have a board members. Any questions? I have a I have a question, Brennan. Just because there are so many different utilities in this corridor that you have to work with, uh, for all of these utilities, do we negotiate agreements with the utilities, or do we come to some understanding with them about the process that's involved in? in relocating their utility? And if so, can you describe how we do that? Sure, we enter into uh, construction agreements with each of the different utilities. Uh, it, it basically defines um, who is responsible for what. Um, we, Hart, as a part of those agreements, is responsible to pay for the relocation of each of the respective utilities, uh, whether it's the electrical lines, the drainage lines, water, fiber optics. Uh, it, it also uh, w discusses responsibilities in terms of construction. What aspects of the work is to be done by HARTS contractors versus what specific work is done by the specific utility itself because uh, many of them do perform or self-perform their own work because of the proprietary nature of their utility. Uh, so there is a lot of coordination between heart our contractors and the utilities uh, based on those agreements and then once we get into construction uh, that coordination must continue so so brennan um for example let's take uh, a hawaiian electric because it's the 138 kvs so if we're going to underground 138 kvs then who to what extent does the quote contractor for heart what would they do in that process and at what point does the hiko uh, I, I guess personnel or subcontractor, whoever they may hire, does the, does the sure. work. At what point? Do we know? So, and, and there is two different phases too, right? We're talking about the design phase and the construction phase. Uh, so, so as we're taking uh, Hawaiian Electric as an example, Hart's consultant is doing the, the majority of the civil design for the undergrounding, the, the trench, the conduit, um, all of that kind of stuff, the finish work. And then HECO takes that and then finishes its um, design for how it's going to interconnect into their system. And then on top of that, when we get into construction, Hart's contractor will be responsible for the major civil work. So digging the trench, putting in the conduits, whatever grouting, uh, the, some of the, the connection work, the physical connection work. And then HECO will then come in, pull its cable, make the connections themselves, and then do the energizing. And then Hart's contractor will then do whatever finish work that is gonna be needed for the, the final uh, civil, civil grade. So 
just so that we're clear on this, Brennan, and when we talk about uh, the heart contractor and what the heart contractor has done, as you know, one of the issues that we've discussed is this infamous $100 million that has been spent on design work. However, so that the public is clear, when we're talking about city center, as when we're talking about airport, we have shifted back. We're not doing what the classic design bid build. We are doing a design build situation. Correct. So the contractor, whoever is selected by heart, and of course the bids are out, but, but and they're being evaluated, but we, as we sit here today, I don't think any of us know. So who, when we say that, what is their obligation to use those designs that we, heart, has paid for in terms of that 100 million, and how much of that is discretionary now on the part of the design build contractor? So it really becomes a business decision by the design build proposers as to how much of our designs that they want to use. Uh, if they believe that they can save more money on the construction side and spend some money on the design side, uh, then they will make that bis business decision to do so because in the end, at the end of the day, they will ultimately save money uh, and provide us with a lower price. Um, but my, my guess is based on the level of design and how far we've already taken it, especially with the utility relocation work, uh, my guess is that the contractors will probably be using uh, most, if not all, of our utility design work as a part of that just because they, ha they, they will have a schedule to maintain and, and I do believe that the amount of coordination and the conflicts that are, that are likely to be present underground, uh, they're going to they're gonna want to take advantage of a lot of the experience that our designers have, have put into the, the plans. So just so that the public is clear, we are not, we meaning heart, are not going to do utilities relocation first, for example, on the heart ticket. In other words, heart's not paying for that straight on as a separate contract. The work that's being discussed here is going to be done part of that design build. The discretion will be on the part of whoever is awarded that contract as to whether they're going to use whatever design Hart has already paid for, part of that $100 million. And when we spoke about, like when HECO takes over, that's where Ms. Iwasa's question about Davis-Bacon comes in because that's relevant to, I believe the PMOC has pointed out that we still have the Davis-Bacon issue outstanding with HECO, am I correct? Correct, and we have not heard uh, any, any final ruling from the Department of Labor, U.S. Department of Labor. And the, and the request to the U.S. Department of Labor on Davis-Bacon is that to permit whatever HECO pays its employees to then basically substitute in for whatever the Davis-Bacon rate may be. It's, it's a conformance request, right. to requesting the U.S. Department of Labor to uh, determine that the wages paid as a part of the collective bargaining agreement currently uh, um, used under operations for, for HECO uh, high voltage workers uh, is or conforms with the intent of Davis-Bacon. Board members, any other questions? Yeah, I just want to try to make that clear then. Um, so the utility relocation work is falling under a contractor out of Hart's contract, so that is a Davis-Bacon rate in doing that. It, right. this, all of the utility relocation work, well, all of the, the, the heavy relocation work uh, is going to be done as a part of this design build contract for the city center guideway and stations. We, we do have an on-call contractor that will be doing some of the advanced temporary relocation work that we, uh, we can get them out in advance of our final contractor. Uh, but, but yes, most of the, the majority of the utility relocation work will be done by the design build contractor. Right. And they, <clears throat> private contractors fall, do fall under Davis-Bacon um, and prevailing wage. The, what, what's at issue is HECO's um, own in-house uh, working crews. Correct. I, I have talking, um, Department of Labor had called me on that because we're the governing body of the Davis-Bacon rate. Right. Um, and on that high voltage side, you know, the explanation <coughs> I gave to them how it normally has always been 
is that if Hawaiian Electric is doing work for their own equipment, such in this case, pulling in their own cable for their equipment, that is always fallen under their contract. Correct. Now, the only thing that I know of that they did change was I believe Hawaiian Electric used to get paid every two weeks. <laughs> Davis Bacon requires every week. So I understand HECO has changed their system to pay them every week though, right? They have converted, so they do have the capability. Okay. I, I'm not sure whether they're actually paying weekly yet or not. I think they may be waiting for some kind of uh, ruling from U.S. Department of Labor. So right now, what I guess the question is, it's whether Department of Labor is going to allow them to use their contract rates um, to pay their workers for doing their work. Yes, that's the question at hand. Okay. Board members, any other questions? So, Brennan, I had one about the design drawings following up to, to Chair Hanabusa. Uh, so the drawings that, that I looked at last week that were sent over by heart for the city to review were actually more than just utilities. And so I'm, I'm curious whether or not the design package that you're talking about, that we talk about 100 million or 90 million, whatever that number is, is it more than utilities? Is it also structural elements and column locations? And, it's everything. And turning lanes and intersections and all of that kind of stuff, yep. right? It's the utility relocation, civil work, uh, foundation, the column foundations, the columns, structural design, the guideways, stu structural design. Uh, it is it is all inclusive. Okay, and then th those drawings are not 100 percent. They're not signed off, right? Correct. By the by the engineering company, and so the design build contractor then has the option of either going with the package that was provided to them and paid for by Hart, or amending it, modifying it, however they believe appropriate, or I guess starting from ground zero if they yes. choose to, right? Yes. Okay, any questions? Thank you. Okay, thank you. So just a general overview of the schedule, um, and, and again, this is a conceptual schedule because uh, final schedule will be determined by the contractor uh, that is selected as a part of the design build contract. Schedule is typically one of the first thing that's uh, provided as a, as a submittal. But just in general, we have started some of the temporary utility relocations uh, in March of this year. That work will continue, or a variety of work, of that type of work will continue into early 2017, uh, or until uh, we, we can get to the point where we need to get out of the permanent contractor's um, uh, way. Roadway and permanent utility relocations, uh, including the undergrounding of the 138, will commence sometime in early 2017 or whenever we are able to get the contractor on board and continue for approximately two years into late 2019. Guideway and station work will be uh, during a th about a three year period in 2019 to 2022. And then once the uh, physical construction is completed, uh, specific, more so on the guideway, then we will be able to commence testing and commissioning uh, and then get into revenue service af yeah, after that. So, so Brennan, just so that we're clear, uh, earlier this year, the board was made aware of um, a letter by Hawaiian Electric, uh, basically talking about sequencing. And, and the issue of sequencing was really on the airport segment. But having said that, the concern that we, all, of course, all shared at that time was if sequencing required undergrounding work to precede construction work, it would add great delay to the project. So as I see your schedule, early 27 to early, late 2019, it appears as if there has been a, con uh, a concession on Hart's part that you are actually going to sequence the undergrounding first before the guideway and the stations? Yes, we will be working with the contractors on starting the undergrounding efforts up front and early uh, and do that work concurrent with much of the other utility relocation as well as guideway construction. So the found drilling of the foundations, uh, constructing of the, the columns, and then ultimately placement of the guideway. We have been uh, in coordination with HECO on working with them to uh, work on a, a one-year overlapping period where we, we would actually have started guideway placement while the 138 uh, KV lines are still up on the steel poles. Uh, and then we would work with the contractor to have those lines undergrounded, energized, and ready to go 
uh, by the time this one year period has elapsed. Uh, it, it still does pose a period of risk uh, in, uh, for HECO's accessibility to those lines should something happen, uh, but we would work with them during that period of time to make sure that they have whatever access that they need, even though it's not necessarily in the kind of environment that they would prefer uh, in terms of, especially in terms of an emergency access. Um, so, but we are working with them on having that overlap. So we will do a lot of the work concurrently uh, and, it, and it just makes sense because the contractor will be able and, and is in some of the um, schematics that I'll show you in the, in the upcoming slides, you'll see the, the sequencing of the work and the complexity of how all the different utilities kind of get moved like jigsaw puzzles back and forth uh, multiple times. And so having the contractor be able to do all of the different types of utility relocations, whether it's uh, the water lines and laterals or it's this 138, is just going to make more sense for them to be able to plan and coordinate their own work logistically so that they can get in and out of the underground area. So, so Brennan, just so the public knows, March 2016, two months ago, we, HART began the temporary utility work. So can you give us examples? So if people were driving down the Dillingham corridor, or uh, this is the Dillingham construction, what would they see that is an example of temporary utility work that HART or HART's, I guess, this isn't our general contractor yet because we haven't awarded that contract. So whoever it is that's doing it, what, what is it that that is evidence of the temporary utility work that has so been engaged this, in. This work is be, being performed under our on-call contract. Um, it is with Royal Construction, and they are our, our general contractor to do some of our general demolishments um, and then some of these temporary utility work. What people would have seen of late is what's called potholing, uh, where they either dig a trench or dig a hole to try and identify or confirm locations of utilities that are shown on as builds or on the utility drawings that we were provided either from agencies or from the utilities themselves that we incorporate into our design. Um, so, so we do that in advance to try and reduce the amount of risk uh, for a contractor because we start to uh, clarify where uh, some of the errors or some of the risk could be. That's what people would see right now, um, but some of the other types of work that they might see would be uh, installation of temporary wooden poles along Dillingham or in other areas, uh, just getting some of the, the shallower, smaller uh, lines out of, out of the way in some areas. So it's, it's not the massive trenching that you would see once the, the primary contractor for the guideway work is, is hired, but more of the, the smaller, very localized type uh, uh, excavation or pole, repl uh, or pole uh, locations. Board Member Hall. Chair, thank you. Uh, Brennan, I applaud your efforts in trying to give us a conceptual uh, schedule here on the relocation. But uh, when do you think we can get a more accurate and accountable schedule? I know after the contract is awarded, but when do you think that would probably be when we can get an accurate schedule as to deadlines? So normally, I mean, we'll, we'll have a, a, a better idea once we hire the contractor because a part of their proposal will be uh, a, a more fleshed out conceptual schedule. And then one of their first primary submittals will be their schedule. So once we have them under contract, I would anticipate anywhere from four to six months we will have a much more detailed uh, schedule from end to end. Thank you. Board Member Louis Kwan. Thank you. Thank you, Brennan. Um, the letter that um, Chair Hanabuso is referring to was dated March 14, 2016. You're, you're familiar with that yes. letter. That's the letter that came from HECO to Chris Takashige, who is the Deputy Director of Design and Construction for HART. And um, I'd like to uh, paraphrase and maybe read some sections off that letter and have you comment on two things. Sure. Uh, what that letter says is, and I quote, Hawaiian Electric has concerns that although Hart previously represented to us of its intent to address the airport and city center clearance issues within the respective bid packages, Brittany Morioka, it's you, 
verbally informed us that the bid documents do not clearly specify that the working clearance issues <coughs> must be addressed prior to the guideway construction. And they end that paragraph by saying, Hawaii Electric strongly urges Hart to consider issuing another airport addendum to instruct bidders to address any existing and future clearance issues prior to construction of the guideway and station. So two things that would be helpful, I think, to our viewing audience for you to address. One, explain the, the working clearance issue. And two, um, explain what, what you've done with respect to incorporating instructions and in bid packages to the, to the contractors to address this concern that was articulated in this letter by HECO. So first of all, working clearance um, that uh, HECO is referring to is basically an operational working clearance that allows uh, HECO crews and equipment to uh, work a little bit more freely uh, independent of environment so that they don't have to worry about their bucket trucks or other kinds of cranes or other kinds of equipment uh, accidentally knocking into uh, some other type of structure and in our case specifically the guideway. Uh, so their desire to have a working clearance from their lines to the guideway itself uh, is meant more for uh, safety precautions for their own workers uh, and, and providing uh, safe clearances away from existing structures uh, so that their, their crews uh, can work in a manner such that they don't have to worry as much about damaging other, other structures or specifically our guideway. Um, the letter is correct in that we do not specifically have uh, the sequencing addressed in our airport procurement document. Um, and at this point, because of where we are or, and where we were uh, in the procurement process, uh, we had indicated to HECO that we were not planning on including or issuing an addendum specific to that, but that we would work with a contractor on dealing with the sequencing issue. Uh, we do intend on issuing an addendum for city center to make this work uh, a requirement to be done more upfront and concurrent uh, with the the other utility relocation work as well as some of the guideway construction. You know, as I've looked at your um, presentation, kind of looking ahead, uh, based on the hard copy that you gave us, um, you, you really did not address or you're not made, making part of your presentation that whole issue, which you know was uh, a fairly significant issue, which is the working clearance issue, but perhaps you can explain for the view and audience the steps that you and Hart have taken to address that issue for the whole 20 mile guideway. Well, so specifically on the, on the east side, so this working clearance, um, they have multiple voltages or different types of voltage lines, 12 kilovolt, 46 kilovolt, and 138 kilovolt, uh, even though they have other levels as well, but those are your three primary uh, voltages. Uh, for 12 kilovolt lines, they prefer a 30-foot uh, working clearance. For a 46 kilovolt line, they require or they request a 40-foot working clearance. And then for the 138 kilovolt lines, they request a 50-foot working clearance. Uh, on the Dillingham corridor, because Dillingham, the right-of-way for Dillingham is already extremely constrained and confined physically, um, we did look at a number of other options, or we tried to look at a number of other options, but because of the physical constraints, in order to provide HECO with uh, those, working clear those safe working clearances, uh, the decision was made to underground the 138 kilovolt lines. Um, the decision on undergrounding the 46 and the 12 was made early in the des design process, um, but we had held out on the 138s because of the, the sheer cost of undergrounding 138s, that we wanted to make sure if we were going to underground the 138s that that was the absolute uh, right decision to make or absolute uh, only decision that we could make uh, for the 138s, both on the airport segment on a, on a very limited section and then primarily on the Dillingham section uh, on, uh, on, uh, in the city center. On the west side, it's a very different situation where the roads are a lot wider, Kamehameha Highway, Farrington Highway, Kualakai Parkway, 
a much more physical open space for equipment options to be considered, which we have been uh, working with HECO on. Uh, we think that we have a very good solution that will address a good portion of the 46 kV, 40 foot working clearance um, along Farrington Highway and uh, a, a good part of Kamehameha Highway. Uh, Kamehameha Highway does have uh, 138 kilovolt lines that we are looking at a crane option. Uh, it may or may not be a solution. We are, we are we're working with HECO on evaluating whether it's a possibility, um, but concurrently we are, we are also working with HECO on undergrounding or attachment options for the 138s on Kamehameha Highway if, if the crane option is not a, a feasible solution. So you recently had a meeting with them. How did that meeting go and what was the result of that meeting? I think, uh, well, uh, part of the, the outcome of that meeting was basically confirmation of what I've just kind of relayed. Uh, that, that we continue to uh, work with them on the equipment options on the west side. Uh, and if those equipment options don't work out for certain locations, then we are working on the uh, on a undergrounding or relocation uh, solution, both for the 138s and for the 46s, because there are some areas where the 46 kilovolt lines are within 16 feet of our guideway, and equipment is just not going to be an option. So we do have to make uh, some effort to either underground or relocate those 46. Um, uh, and then again on the east, uh, we uh, reiterated our commitment to uh, underground the 12, 46 and the 138s uh, on Dillingham and work with them on the sequencing so that uh, we can provide them with a fully energized undergrounded 138 kilovolt uh, double circuits because they, they have two different circuits on Dillingham. Uh, within a one-year period of the first segment, guideway segment going up in the air. You know, on the same topic of undergrounding, the project management oversight contractor, Jacobs Engineering, in its report of March of this year, indicated that to accommodate the undergrounding, you pro the heart would need to acquire about 100 small parcels um, from private owners and about 146 parcels from public and, and DOT um, ownership. Um, what is the cost of that going to be? I'm, I'm not exactly sure. Um, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head. Um, but there, and, and I'm not sure if the number of parcels that are going to be affected is going to be that high. Uh, there will be, because of undergrounding the 138s, there will be a need to have in certain locations uh, vaults that can accommodate the splicing uh, of the of the of the 138 kilovolt lines, and so in those areas, because the vault, underground vaults are quite substantial, they're about 10, 8 to 10 feet wide and 20 feet long. Uh, they will probably enter into some areas of either private property or uh, and or or we try and look for um, public property such as. Uh, Honolulu Community College as an option so that we're dealing with public lands rather than private lands. Uh, but that, as we refine our design on the 138 kilovolt, because that, that aspect of our, of our relocations is still going through the design process, uh, we will uh, firm out what land requirements will be necessary for those additional vaults and connections, um, and, and then we'll proceed from there. But our right, of, our right of way group is working very closely with our design group in terms of identifying what those needs are or could be so that we can start a process of, 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 of any acquisition or easements that we might need. And primarily, it's typically going to be an, an easement. So, Brennan, I, you know, I, I appreciate the honesty in those, in those answers. And I guess what stands out to me is, is really a, uh, an extension of Mr. Nakamura's question. And that is that when we listen to the answers, there's still a lot of unknowns, right? Will the, will the equipment work? Um, you know, what's going to be done by our construction contractor via the design drawings that exist versus what they're going to price out to do differently? All of these things are sort of moving targets for us. Correct. And yet we're in a situation now where, based on the estimated revenue that we're going to get from the GET surcharge, we may not have financial capacity for a full project build out. And so for a board who's looking to quantify the cost of the project so we can figure out if we need to de-scope, 
and yet we have pieces of the project that are not known yet, how do you give us something that we can work with for the purpose of moving forward? Are you, are you including in the budget a worst case scenario figure so that we always know that if we come in less than that, in other words, if we manage down, we'll be protected? That's, that's what I'm looking for, is some certainty as we try to go through this, this financial process. Yeah, so, so as an example on the west side, some of the numbers that we've been talking about as potential exposure for uh, uh, additional expenses for the HECO issues. Uh, we, we are, in, in our update, we will be carrying a worst case undergrounding scenario uh, for the west side, because that would be the worst case scenario unless uh, other overhead relocation options might be available or the equipment option can start paring down some of those numbers. So at least we'll work off of the worst case scenario or what, what, what we can uh, estimate to be our worst case scenario because you're still going to be plus or minus because it's still uh, high level estimates um, until you get into actual final designs. On the east side, um, you know, we are putting together our, our best estimates on what we think are typical construction costs in the uh, more urban environment. And then you, you kind of start adding uh, inefficiencies, risk to some of those numbers, and that's where some of the contingency numbers start coming in as well. Okay, so I hope, I know I think it's, uh, it's pretty common knowledge now that uh, the FTA and the PMOC came in at a P65 of roughly $8 billion. And we're working on our, on our best estimate based on our, our model. Um, but I hope that, that truly whatever we come up with, that number that we come up with, we are including enough contingency and enough extra money in a worst case scenario situation that whatever happens moving forward, we're protected. Yes, because we're on the same page. And, and I take it that's different than what we've done in the past? To some degree. Okay. Board members, yes. yes. So Brennan, I just want the people to be aware of, when, we, when you talked about the potholing, how many potholings, and basically what we're trying to do is say what people say is underground and what is there, right? So how many potholing did you do about? Well, to, well, we have many, many more to go, right. um, but I believe the, my last briefing was we had done approximately 21, 22 potholes, and about three of them were accurate. So, so, so that the public understands that. So as we went down to check if our ads builds were correct, only three of the 21 random pukas that we dug were correct. Were ex they were exactly as they were shown on the plans. The others varied from either being completely wrong to being something missing or something being one foot off or five feet off or whatever it is. Yeah. But so it, it varied. So in, in any situation, what that's going to mean is that if, if that, quote, probabilities hold true throughout the whole line, we're probably going to be substantially off from what we think. So that's also going to inconvenience the public mm -hmm. as well as cause disruption in terms of traffic. I just want people to know that that's the other factor that we're dealing with. And I also want it to be very clear because I don't think that the public understands that when this project began, the heart bill, so to speak, what heart is going to pay for is really 100% of the quote unquote, the utility relocations, yes. including potentially the 46 KV station or the, the power station that we may have to, that may be constructed at the quote, the rock center that we saw in the news. So that the, that's what it means. So when we talk about this, we're talking about how much the project is going to have to bear. And I also, would, that, would you agree with me on that? Yes. The other thing that I think the public should also be aware of is that when we talk about undergrounding lines, it isn't simply that we're going to underground the lines. There are different methodologies of undergrounding that line, which also differs in terms of the cost. So if we do what is called an HPFF system, high pressure fluid, 
that's probably the most expensive. And if we go to the dielectric system, it's less expensive, but it also has consequences as to how we step it up and down. So that every time we go from up to down, there's a cost. And down to up, there's a cost. So would you also agree with that? Yes. So, so when we talk about these figures, they are, of course, estimates. But the estimates can go the whole range, depending on what and how we decide. So when we're talking about undergrounding, I understand that the numbers that the heart is using is for a dielectric system. Is that correct? Yes. So if we are, for some reason, forced to go to HPFF, that's also going to add a cost. And it's, it's going to be more expensive. Correct. So, but as of, as of today, uh, our discussions and negotiations with HECO has gone with the dielectric solution. Which is very unusual, because HECO has always presented undergrounding with the HPFF system. Thank you. So, Brennan, I have a follow-up to that question, and it has to, really, it's a follow-up to the potholing. So if the potholing, we've done 21 and 3 have ended up what we predicted. And I know when we did the Joint Traffic Management Center and we came across Alapai and King, nothing was where we thought it would be. And we went over on that contract just because the utilities were not accurate with the as-builts. So um, it's a design-build contract. Yes. And we've given them drawings that are 90% but are unstamped. So when they start excavating and they encounter something that is shown on the drawing but is not, in fact, the same, is that at our risk and our cost or is that their cost? There's a level of sharing of some of that risk. Um, there, is, there is some, there, there's language in, in our contracts that allow for some level of plus or minus deviations from the plans. But if there is a significant deviation from what is on the plan, then uh, it, it is typically not the responsibility of the contractor to bear that cost because they can only bid and price what is represented to them. Uh, and so that, is, that risk is typically borne by the owners. Uh, so there is, there is a way to deal with what's called differing site conditions. Um, where a contractor can make a claim uh, and justify whether or not uh, it, it is reasonable for them to be able to say that this could not have been known by us, in which case we would negotiate how we would pay for this claim. And okay. just to kind of give you a, a sense, on the west side, um, the first 10 miles between West Oahu Farrington Highway Project and the Kamehameha Highway Guideway, we had 91 different instances of differing site claims for you, specifically for utilities. There's other differing site claim, differing site condition claims, but specifically for utility purposes, where it was more than three or four or five feet from where it was supposed to be, or it, something was. Uh, there that wasn't even shown on the plans. Uh, there were 91 instances on okay. the west side. So first I want to just clarify for the public, when you say owners, it would be the risk on the owners of the cost on the owners. You're talking about us, the city, it, it Hart. Would be, the owner is Hart, the city, yeah. yes. Okay, so of those 91 on the west side, what percentage of those manifest themselves in change orders if they're outside that expected range of, of deviation? I mean, is that, are all of those we're, going to be we're, we're still in negotiations in some of them, so I wouldn't, I don't, I don't really want to speculate right now. So it's negotiated then? Yes. So th the concern on the east side, where we have more utilities in a very tight corridor, is that we have sufficient contingency and, you know, figures in the budget that later we're not going to face change orders and say, now we're out of money again. So that's, that's I guess, my point, is that the there's a lot yes. of unknowns, and I just want to make sure the budget is tight. Right. Board members, any questions? Yeah, I just got one question, and I've revisited this many times with you. Uh, but, uh, you know, it seems that we're spending a lot of money building this car, uh, that we could always use this uh, guideway by putting conduits in and using it for transmission. We, we did look at that. Yeah, I'm sure um, you folks exercised all those options, yeah. but, you know, it still seems like you know, there should be conduits in there that can be used for transmission. 
Well, so, so one of the options was to look at, at hanging or attaching it onto the guideway, um, but un undergrounding along Dillingham uh, actually made a little bit more sense in, in this specific uh, area. We are looking at attaching the, the 138s on the Komeme Highway segment because uh, just some of the congestion with some of the utilities there makes attachment a little bit more attractive. So I mean, we are we are looking at the whole uh, menu of, of options. Okay, board Thanks. members, any other questions? So Brennan and I have one before you move on. This is a good slide for questions. Um, it has to do with with really the sequencing, and I know that that um, I read the memo that you put together of of the meeting that we had with Hico, and I appreciate you memorializing that. But my concern is that before you go out with the addendum to the city center contractor. Are we going to know that HECO is in fact on the same page with us so that as the contractor begins the work and begins sequencing the undergrounding along with the construction, we're not going to run into a situa situation later where HECO is going to claim somehow we have to stop work or you know delay the project because they're not satisfied with the sequencing? Are we going to have an agreement? Are we going to have, how are we going to know that they're on the same page with us? Well, we are we are working with them um, on resource issues right now because one of the one of the factors uh, on being able to achieve that one year period is uh, the amount of electrical contractor resources that can do some of the work, uh, and it is very specialized uh, electrical work, and so uh, we are working with them on how we make sure that there is the amount of resources necessary to keep up with schedule. Um, <clears throat> so we, we're in the process of working or negotiating with them on that and making sure that we come up with a resource plan that is acceptable to both of us. Um, we will try to memorialize some of those issues, um, but I, I would say that uh, HECO has just as much incentive to make sure that this one-year period uh, is reduced as much as possible, uh, just as much as, as HART does, because the longer that guideway is up, uh, and the 138s are still up in the air, there is risk to HECO's own ability to service those lines um, freely. And so uh, they, they do have their own incentive uh, to make sure that, that this one-year period gets done sooner than the 12 months. Okay, board members, questions? Thank you, Brennan. Okay, now we're gonna get to the good slides. Okay, so the next set of slides and then uh, kind of like an animation shows you the, the s complexity of, of what's gonna happen throughout the entire project. Not just the undergrounding, but I mean, not just the, um, the utility relocation work, but also how the utility relocation work starts to coincide with other aspects, including the guideway construction as well. So this is just a, an example. This is not how it looks everywhere along Dillingham Boulevard, but this is just a representative illustration of what some utilities might look like. Uh, the, you have the 138 power poles, the light poles, the, one, the, the wooden pole on the Mackay side, uh, and, and then you have the two lanes of traffic in both directions with the single turning lane in the middle. And as you can see, uh, there are a couple utilities right in the middle of the road where our column is going to go. So right there, uh, some of that has to, uh, it's very clear that those conflicts, and, that, and that's what we call as a conflict, those conflicts have to be moved. But in order to do that, there's a whole bunch of other utilities that are also in the way in order to accommodate some of these larger utilities. So the next slide kind of starts to circle all the different utilities that have to be moved at some period of time from its current location to a new location, and in some instances from its current location to a temporary location and then back to a permanent location. And then that is intended to get to a final configuration where we are clear of utilities uh, below our foundations, uh, the 138, uh, metal poles are gone and under, the 138s are underground and everything is kind of in a little bit more logical uh, setup. So this drawing just kind of shows uh, it's, a, it's, it's very messy, but that's what we're dealing with. 
a lot of utilities all over the place, and it's not just all in one direction. As you can see, there's a lot of lateral connections or lines going across the road uh, to get from these large distribution lines. Um, there's serv uh, service connections for sewer laterals, water laterals, all kinds of, th kinds of things. Uh, fiber optic connections to businesses, um, power connections with, from the 12 kilovolt lines. So the first and foremost, we, we focus on the conflicts that are in the way of the shafts. And so that's what we first have to look at relocating. And then if it's a larger line, then uh, we need to look at how we fit this into a puzzle. And we do that by manipulating the different lines in different locations. So, you, so moving one line can then precipitate the need to move two other lines or three other lines. And so that's, this is kind of an iterative process, which is why relocation of utilities is probably your biggest risk. And it's also the most complex in terms of, uh, of, of coordination because one thing then affects a whole bunch of other things uh, down the line. It's, it, it very much is a domino effect. So Brennan, can you go back one slide? Yep. So yes, if I, that's your final, I mean, I know it's not engineering. I know it's a schematic for the purposes of discussion. But basically, the blue boxes and, and circles are intended to represent the final location after all the relocation is done, right? Correct. So there's not a lane of travel that does not have some excavation done to place a utility beneath it, right? There is basically no lane that will be saved at some point in time. Yeah, so can you explain to the, to the viewers and the, and the people here today how the design build contractor, and I know they dictate the means and methods, but basically how they will do that and will they be able to keep a portion of this boulevard open for the traveling, traveling public? So, and then that's why it just makes sense for the same contractor to be doing all of the work because then they can sequence the work properly themselves. So they can, they can do look aheads to see uh, where, what lines need to be moved and where so that they can start thinking or strategizing how they're going to do their traffic control as well. What, where on the road can they dig a trench while at the same time preserve two lanes of traffic on Dillingham Boulevard open at all times? Uh, either two lanes going in the townbound direction in the morning or two lanes in the outbound or the, the EVA bound direction in the afternoon uh, as is probably will be required by the Department of Transportation for uh, capa capacity, corridor capacity to get onto um, H1. <clears throat> but also w at least one lane of traffic in each direction during the middle of the day. And so those are some of the requirements that um, we will be placing on the contractor. Um, even though we are floating ideas, extreme ideas, of potentially working with the businesses in the corridor in specific regions. So like on Dillingham, we would probably look at an area from Ka'ahi or the Ivale substation to Kokea Street or maybe to Waikamilo, uh, where we can look at closing down Dillingham Boulevard completely in all directions overnight from say 8 p.m. To, to 9 or 9 p.m. at night when most businesses have already closed HCC uh, stops classes at nine o'clock, uh, and then let the contractor get in, do what they need to do, hammer out uh, uh, as much as they can uh, unobstructedly, and then reopen four or five o'clock in the morning. Uh, we believe that by allowing our contractor to do that, we, in that specific stretch, we might be able to reduce the schedule by about 20% in that specific area, um, which I think um, would benefit many of the businesses. And, and we are just focusing in the, in the industrial business areas, not in any residential areas. So um, th this, this corridor from Waikamilo to uh, Ka'ahi seems to be a very logical area to be able to float this kind of proposal. Okay, so Brennan, when you say that, and I understand that's, that's a decision that that heart and the city will make and then dictate to the to the contractor. Correct. Um, what's the lead time for you working with the businesses and the community to make sure that they understand when and if you're gonna have a full shutdown? Starting now. Okay, so we've already started some of that outreach. We've already started floating the idea. We've been meeting with some of the agencies uh, who would be affected by it. We've been meeting with um, some of the large larger businesses specifically in that corridor, the Costco's, the Zippies, the city squares, 
uh, Dillingham uh, Shopping Center, which is Kamehameha Schools, uh, Honolulu Community College, uh, all of those um, uh, major businesses in that specific area, including um, Institute for Human Services, uh, anyone who might be impacted by a cl closure of that magnitude, we've already started to float the idea. And then as we start to get a little bit more certainty, we would start to work with them on specifics. And because part of our outreach is to understand what is their business operations? When do they have deliveries? Where, what roads do they typically have deliveries? What types of trucks do they bring? That kind of thing. So it's an educational process for us first, and then we can work with them on what some of the specifics would end up being. Okay, thank you, Brennan. Board Member Hanabusa. Brennan, I, I have to ask you this question. So how many years have you been on HARC or working in some capacity, whether in the present capacity or even before that, that you've worked on this real project? Maybe that's the better way of putting it. So I've, I've been an actual employee of HARC since 2013, so three years. Uh, but I've been involved in some capacity during my time at Department of Transportation since 2005 when the EIS began. So. You're actually probably as familiar with it in, in the, in, as well as in your role as the state DOT director as well. So, Brennan, let me ask you this question, because I'm sure as everyone is listening to this, the question that is running through everyone's mind is, why did we go down Dillingham? Why did we go down Dillingham? Do you know? So if, if I were to just come up to you on the street and say, why? Did they put the rail down Dillingham? You gotta have known. We've got if you're going to go down and create a media strip and put the rail down there, you've got to have known that there is not you, but the, whoever planned this had got to have known that we would have problems, like the 42-inch water main, for example, that we now see. Right. Why do you have any idea why we chose Dillingham? Mm, I can only guess. Um, as we didn't I, I, do it I, either, but you know, right. why did they choose Dillingham? I, my understanding it was based on ridership evaluations, um, other other alternative routes. Um, my understanding was that they were deemed not as attractive as Dillingham. Uh, the only other major corridor that would have been out there for consideration would have been Nimitz Highway. But my understanding at the time uh, was that Nimitz was not a route that could be considered uh, very seriously because the DOT at the time also had its own active environmental impact statement going for what's called the Nimitz flyover. Uh, and, and that was and, you, by the way. Yes, it was. <laughs> I just want everybody to know that which, which, which is not say moving, that, so. we, you, we're speaking with some authority here. Yes. Okay. Uh, so, so that... Um, would have, so Nimitz would have been precluded from that area from Kehi interchange to Ivalet. So, based on ridership and everything else is what you understand, the reason why the decision was made that it would go down, the local preferred alternative would go down Dillingham. So let me ask you the $64 million question. As you sit here before us, as an engineer, would you have done it? I don't want to second guess what's in our record of decision. Yeah, but you can now. So we're going to have to look at this very seriously. We are. And, and I think, yes, and I think that's one of the options that we're trying to put together some discussion points for our, our next board meeting on June 8th. Okay. okay, thank you. Board Member Hall. Yeah, usually people learn from history. And I'm kind of a historian. Uh, my grandmother used to live right where the airport terminal was, 561 Airport Road. And we used to ride the train in. And the corridor that the old ORNL train ran, I think was a beautiful laid out corridor and very usable. And uh, it navigated through floods, it navigated through traffic, and it did real well. I, I just don't see it like, uh, my colleague Colleen said why they wanted to go down doing them when they could have utilized the old ORNL corridor down there. Okay. Board members, any other questions or comments? Okay, okay. now to get to some of the fun ones. So this is a little bit more animated, so 
I am not sure if, if some of the animation will be able to show up on, uh, for the viewers on Olelo. Um, so please bear with me if you're watching on TV. Uh, but this kind of shows you some of the, the moving parts of, of not just the utility relocation, but the overall project from start to finish. So this is Dillingham Boulevard, Malka uh, to your left, Makai to your right. So you, you can see that there is both the two 138 kilovolt circuits on both sides. No median in the middle. You have a turning lane, so two lanes of traffic in each direction. Sidewalks on both sides. First thing we'll do is some of the temporary relocation where we need to move some what's called the dry utilities. So the t uh, fiber optics or telecoms. So you can see we put in a temporary pole got some of the smaller utilities out of the way because as you can see there are some bigger utilities that are below mm -hmm. and because we need service connections on both sides uh, we have to got to put in a, a connection connection overhead not at all the dry utilities and the, or the smaller surf surface utilities are out of the way we can then start looking at uh, some of the road widening efforts. So we widening, we, you know, we bought all those strips of land along the Mackay side so we can widen Dillingham Boulevard on the Mackay side so that we can put in our columns and preserve the number of lanes of traffic. So we, now we've moved the traffic over so that we can have a wider area, wider roadway cross section, and be able to uh, build in a median. And in that process, we will also start moving some of the larger wet utilities, the sewer, the water, concrete encased, the 42 inch water line. Then we'll start putting back some of the dry utilities the telecom lines, Hawaiian Telecom, put in the 12 kV line, new AT&T lines, new fiber optics, bury both 138 kV circuits, bury the 46 kV circuit. Okay, so now that we got everything back in place, underground, and out of the way for the uh, guideway itself, we can start with some of the roadway improvements, getting it ready for the final cross section. Oops, sorry. Oops. Oh, I'm sorry, okay. So this is, this is what, once we're done with all of the uh, utility relocations, this is kind of what the, the new utility underground world will look like. And then when we get back to some of the construction, we will start energizing the 12 kilovolt lines right there. So we energize that so we could take down the, the K, uh, 12 kV wire across so we can start installing mm -hmm. the columns and the foundations. Mm -hmm. <coughs> then we start energizing the 46 kV lines energizing the 138 kV line so then we can take down one of the poles energize the second 138, take down that pole. Then we can start taking down all the other temporary wooden poles. And then we finish with the guideway up on top. So that's kind of the sequencing of, of the, the work, including the utility relocations from the beginning, and then how it proceeds throughout during the different phases of construction activities of the guideway as well. Um, but as you saw, there is a number of 
trenching that we're going to have to be doing. And so significant portions of Dillingham will be closed uh, during parts of the day and then hopefully at night as well. And these next two set of slides is just, just to kind of give you a flavor of the roadway network that we're going to be looking at having to utilize or accommodate uh, as we do construction work. So this yellow line is the guideway going down uh, Dillingham Boulevard. And so you have alternate routes in Nimitz Highway. This is, I believe, King Street, H1. I'm not sure if this is School Street or is this? This is H1, this is School, I think. So there are a number of parallel roads, a number of Malcolm Mackay connectors that we will work with both the state and the city DTS on looking at how we manage traffic through the corridor. Um, stopping or, or diverting traffic in one location does have significant impacts everywhere else along the corridor. So it's going to be a, a very comprehensive uh, congestion management program that we're going to have to uh, entertain. So, Brennan, before you go on <clears throat> to the next corridor, uh, I have a question about all the utility work. So, I mean, I really appreciate that, the way you did the PowerPoint. I think it, you know, for me on the board, it, it certainly educates me about the complexity of the project, and I appreciate that. Uh, but the, another thing that I realize is that all over town I see that we do in-road work, and then we go back and we resurface, and then three months later we do in-road work. And so in this corridor, when we go and we put all of these utilities in new locations, are we doing it in any way that later if somebody needs to access the utility that it is access friendly versus having to go in and, and just tear up the roadways again? Can you tell me what the process is for that? Sure, yes, yeah, so, so long-term um, accessibility and maintenance is also just as important to many of the utilities and agencies uh, that we're relocating some of their uh, infrastructure. And so part of their review process, uh, their comments do include accessibility to their, to their, um, to their lines at some point in the future as well. So uh, all of that does get incorporated into our designs. Okay. Board members, any questions? Okay. So last slide is just the next corridor, which is basically from uh, Evil Aid down uh, Chinatown area on the west side all the way to Ala Moana. And again, you know, we have a whole a very complicated network of roads, especially as we enter into the Kaka'ako area. Um, and so again, it's gonna be a very comprehensive congestion management plan that we're gonna have to be operating under. Uh, and working with all the various agencies to ensure that uh, we are coordinated in the amount of road work going on, the type of road work, and who's doing what road work. And it can be a utility company doing road work on Baratania that can have an impact on this project or vice versa. So um, we, we are working with the various agencies to make sure that we have that open dialogue and communication so that we know what's going on uh, in different parts of these corridors. Okay, board member Kim. <clears throat> so, Brennan, I have a question. So, on the uh, 42 inch water line, do you know the age of those pipes and the sewer pipes? You guys have any idea? Uh, we don't, uh, we can get that information, but we don't know. The have reason it. I'm asking is because, I mean, if you see all over the news, right, water main breaks here all over the place. So. I mean, if you want to see a silver lining in this whole thing, is that we're replacing that whole line right over there. And upgrading well, not the, the whole system. line, but a significant the amount. Significant I, I part believe of it, it was like 10,000 linear feet of, of water line. Not necessarily the 42, but because there's a number of 12s and 8s and, and also some so of the laterals. So in this case, my question is, being that if we're going to be upgrading and in heart is paying for it, would Board of Water Supply give some kind of money to that because that's their line that we're, we're upgrading, right? In that essence, I suppose it breaking somewhere down the line and they would have to pay for it. They're digging up the road and they're fixing it. You know, I, I mean, you look at the sewer line. Sewer, sewer line is city, right? I mean, so <laughs> that's our, that's our they, problem. They haven't offered, but. <laughs> but I think that's something to look at. I mean, because like I said, we are upgrading their line, part yes. of their line. I mean, yeah, like you said, um, Member Kim, a, a secondary benefit of this project is a significant upgrade of brand new infrastructure, not just transportation infrastructure, but utility infrastructure uh, 
up and down the corridor on, on all of our roadways. Okay, board members, questions? Okay, so Brennan, that's the end of the PowerPoint. And yes. then I think if we have some other questions, I have a few that I wanted to ask about. Um, one I know I read in the paper about our request of the Kaka'ako HCDA board to be able to do potholing in their jurisdiction. And evidently, they, no one on the board would make a motion so it, it, didn't, uh, it didn't get an affirmative vote. Uh, can you tell us what the plan is? Because that obviously is critical for us moving forward. What's the plan with, with HCDA? Sure, so yeah, I wasn't, I had, did not attend that HCDA board meeting, so I'm not, um, I don't have firsthand knowledge of exactly what the discussion was, but uh, we have had subsequent conversations. I've spoken to uh, Chair John Whalen myself on, on what, they would like to see as a part of our next presentation. So I believe the first week of June is their next ACDA board meeting. Uh, I have committed to them that I would make the presentation myself and be available for questions. Um, they would like us to focus more on our business and community outreach uh, and the notification process uh, so that they can ensure that their, uh, <clears throat> I guess, area businesses are as informed as possible. And so that's what, what uh, our, we will focus our presentation on. And, and our understanding is that uh, that is what they're looking for and, and that uh, we should be able to receive our right of entry to perform our construction work. Okay, and for potholing, can you, can you give us a sense of the size of the hole that you drill or you bore for the purposes of confirming utilities? What's the size of that? It, it really depends. Um, it can range from a, a very small hole, if it's, especially if it's a, a surface utility that you're trying to identify, uh, you know, from like a, a, just a 12 by 12 inch, one, a one foot square kind of shallow hole to maybe even a six foot by six foot uh, square out in the middle of the road or a, a thin trench that goes just clear across the roadway to try and get a sense of the cross section. Um, so it really depends on what we're trying to identify, um, but it is very localized and it is in, in specific areas and we, and we can control traffic uh, impacts uh, fairly, fairly um, adequately for, for pothole activities. Okay. Yes. I have a question on that. So this potholing, I mean, how efficient is it as opposed to doing maybe a, just a few samples and stop doing that? I mean, because it costs us money to do every single one, right? As opposed to the contractor's got to go in there, dig up the place anyway. And it's, it's we're guessing that, you know, again, if you look at the as builds, as you said, three was correct out of the 21 or something. I mean, so what's the difference between that as opposed to the contractor, whoever has that contract already, just going in, start digging, start doing the right. lines, because we basically know it's in there. If we just don't know what depth and if it's on that line itself, right? Part, part of it is to um, reduce the perceived risk of the uncertainty of the drawings. Uh, the more we can clarify in the drawings for a contractor to price, the uh, less risk that they will hedge in their pricing, uh, so we should get a little bit more competitive pricing. Uh, it, it, we, don't, we don't do, it, when you compare the amount of linear footage of utility work that we need to relocate, um, it's not a significant amount of pothole locations that, that we do considering the, the extent of the area. And the locations that are chosen are very strategic. We try to identify locations where uh, we believe the uncertainty is greater and we want to bring a little bit more certainty or the type of work is gonna necessitate a lot more uh, <clears throat> digging up as compared to if, if they, a con what we don't want the contractor to do is dig, dig or start digging up a road uh, that they think is going to be a significant excavation and then it'd be all wrong and then now they got to dig up the whole road. If we can start to help them narrow down their trenching efforts, then that also helps uh, alleviate some of the impacts during construction on traffic congestion because instead of having the contractor chase, uh, they can be a little bit more focused. So it's, it's more of a risk reduction. Um, than, than anything else. So if they're digging in a specific area because you want to see maybe there's a cross in the road right over there, so they dig up that area and they don't find it, does he just stop and go, okay, and report it to you that it's not there, or does he search for where that place is? It's a little bit of both. They'll start notifying us that, that things are not 
where they where we said it's supposed to be and then we will work with them on trying to figure out okay how do we start tracking this stuff down so is that similar to if a contractor had their job and he has to do the same thing and search for oh no no you're talking about when we're doing when we're potholing yeah, when you oh no when we're potholing it's it's we're just trying to identify that specific location that right, we're trenching. so if it's if it's shown on a plan that it's supposed to have and it's not there that's all you're reporting then. They're not looking for that one pipe or whatever it is. It, it depends, it depends. Sometimes that's all we'll report, that certain lines are not there or they're not exactly where uh, the drawings, or at least we start to identify on the plans that they're not, uh, they were not where uh, they're, they're currently represented. And there may be some deviations in the plans, but then at least that helps the contractor price in some of their risk. Um, or we may look uh, we may have a discussion internally to figure out do we want to chase this more because the impact of being that wrong uh, would have more impacts during construction than if we can identify it during the design phase. Now, is there also a responsibility as far as the as builds like how many electric? Because I remember, you know, I came from a field, I did underground work. If the line showed to run a certain, and they gave measurements, right? So many feet from the curb and all that, you're running your line. If you deviate that, the contractor is responsible. If they didn't get a change and okay from Hawaiian Electric, and they deviated from that on their own, the contractor who put it in is liable for that line and has to move it. You heard anything like that with Hawaiian Electric? Because Hawaiian Tel I know had that when we had a project on Nimitz that there was a reason why you had to go around where there's nothing there. And that's because they said in the future they were gonna put a, you know, some sewer line or something in there, right? And that way if you, if you went straight, we would be liable in going there and fixing it on our dime because we didn't follow the plans. Yes, that, that is sometimes the case. So Hawaiian Electric's as built compared to what you guys got and not finding these things, are these being coordinated as to who's responsible for that then? No. Typically in the design, the utilities, and it's not just Hawaiian Electric, right? Board right. of Water Supply drawings are just as bad as Hawaiian Electrics or Oceanics or the city's sewer lines. Drawing, it's, it's, almost, uh, it's almost blind to the utility that is providing the, the as-builts. Especially the older the as-builts, the worse they are. Mm -hmm. um, and so if the, if the as-builts are wrong, it, it typically is on the entity doing the, con do, doing the construction that bears the, the cost of those errors. The new construction. The new construction, yes. I mean, that's why it's one of the most frustrating things for any of the road agencies, because when the road agencies do widening work or, or some kind of structural work that requires uh, some level of relocation or, or digging underground and the utilities are all wrong, uh, it, it's, it becomes a very difficult problem for the road agencies. Board members? Yes. Oh. Brendan, if you go back to the slide <clears throat> that basically um, is called Dillingham Boulevard Utility Relocation, where it has everything, yeah, that one that there. One? You know, one of the things that struck me is the fact that we really can't uh, maximize on any economies of scale in the sense that if we were to stack utilities, for example, and uh, not spread them across the way they are now, we would arguably be able to dig a trench, and I, I don't like trenching, as you know, but, but we would have to dig a trench, and we could stack whatever we could stack, like whether you put the 138s and the 46 and 12. The way this is, is that we're not gonna have any breaks in terms of any economies of scale of trenching because it's, it's almost trenching under every lane of highway. And, and, and not in all cases. Where, where we can uh, utilize shared trenches, we are. Uh, and it's not, this is not representative of the entire corridor. Um, so in, in some instances, we are able to share trenches, but in, in many instances, we are also not because of certain requirements, especially for the, the wet utilities, there are certain, uh, uh, yeah. Clearance like sewer, requirements. Sewer and water can't go in the no. same area. <laughs> right? I mean, no. we understand that. Correct. But, and, but, but like the, the 138s require certain separation, uh, the 46, the 12. So, and, and, and uh, 
we also have to uh, keep in mind the accessibility issue, right? Because especially the smaller lines, like the 12 kVs, the, um, the fiber optic lines, have to be more accessible uh, for these specific companies because uh, as we go down, this is, these are the lines that have to be uh, serviced into the various properties. And so, so there's, a whole bu there's a whole bunch of scenarios that go into uh, citing these, these different utilities. But like, like to your point, where we can share and, and use the economies of scale, we're trying to. The, the other question I had is, uh, as you know, like I asked you, why did we go down Dillingham? The other question is, why are we, why are we where we are with Hawaiian Electric at this stage of this project? Because we don't have the west side resolved yet, and and though the people do not have that slide, I mean, what are what are we looking at? Potentially worst case scenario, I think, is an additional two hundred million dollars on the west side, just and that's not budgeted. So why are we here? I mean, you know, you started the project in twenty thirteen. You've had some dealings with Hart in other <coughs> capacities before that. But why is it that, you know, Hawaiian Electric has, has basically written us that letter that, that member Kwan, Louis Kwan talked about, where they clearly, the, the tone of that letter was not very nice. Mm -hmm. It's almost like, you know, we keep telling you guys and you don't listen. And we know from the production of documents that took place with the Star Advertiser that they have highlighted how many times they told us to to look at the clearance issues and, and Hart and or Hart's contractor seems to have ignored it. Yeah. So given that history, one why, one, why are we here at that point? And two, how are you gonna repair that relationship? And I, you know, and I'm, I'm like Chair Formby, I wanna know, <laughs> I mean, when we put out the, the second bid or the third bid or whatever it's gonna be, or if we do an addendum or we don't do an addendum, how do we know that they're just not gonna say, we had it with you guys? And we seem to say, oh, we've been working fine, but you know, we're working fine, but we get a letter like that in March of this year. So I, we're, in terms of the east with airport and city center, um, to, to me, where we are in the discussion and dialogue with Hawaiian Electric uh, is, for me as, as, as an engineer on the design side, it's, it's not abnormal for us to be at this point of discussion because you gotta remember we're still in the design phase. Design didn't start until 2013, 2014 timeframe. And so a lot of the comments that are typically done, the back and forth is done during the design phase, which is why for airport and city center, you had a lot of that dialogue going on in 2013, 2014, uh, and then 2015 as you start to wrap up the design. <clears throat> and so, so to where we are in terms of, of dealing with the HECO lines on the east, I, I, I'm, I'm not surprised that, that we're, at, we're at the point of having made the decisions when we made them, um, right? The, the 12 and the 46 kV lines being underground, I think those decisions were made in the earlier part of the design process. The 138s, um, we, had, we had purposely pushed off because of the cost factor, trying to see if there were other options other than undergrounding and ultimately the determination was that we needed to underground. Um, and we are in, we're wrapping up or, or working on the design for the, that 138, but the other, the other utility work for HECO has been incorporated into our design package already. Um, on the west side, you know, I, I can only guess what some of the, how those, some of those conversations were going in the 2009, 2011 time period. Um, but again, you know, 2009, the project was still in its environmental pl uh, planning phase, and so comments are typically very high level and generic. Um, and then you start to kind of flesh them out during the design period, and again, this is design build, so the design build process for uh, West Oahu Farrington Highway was, I, I think the contract was 2009, so much of the design work started in 2010, which is why you probably see a lot of the comments coming back from HECO 
on a more technical level in the 2010, 2011 timeframe. Um, so the, the timing from a project delivery standpoint makes sense, but I don't, I, I can't answer as to why certain decisions were not made at that time. But since, um, since many of the folks who are on board at Heart Now have been on board, uh, our focus has been on making the, those decisions and coming up with all the different scenarios, the pros and cons, uh, so that we can make these decisions. And I think that's kind of where we're, why we're at the point now, on the east side at least, having made a lot of those decisions. And so we have a, a path forward. Still a lot of uncertainty, especially when you talk about utility relocation. Um, but I mean, I think, I think we are progressing uh, in, in a normal fashion. It's just uh, a lot of this design discussion typically is not made in such a public fashion just because I think the nature of this project uh, starts to bring out a lot of the early conversations more publicly. So you, you normally don't see that kind of dialogue um, uh, in, in public about uh, the design protocols. And before, before Member Louis Kwan speaks, I just want to say this, and that's that I understand that, notwithstanding where it, where it hits the board, is the money. The budget. It's how much in the budget, and what are we, you know, we can't be looking at saying to the council, because they remind me every time, 1.2 billion and not a penny more, and then they say two months later, you guys can't tell us how much it's going to cost. I mean, why is that? So, you know, it, it, I understand that. I understand the engineering parts of it got to go. But where the board gets hit is because we, people think we understand where the money is. We understand the project because we got to go out there and ask for the budget. And so they look at us, especially council and the legislature, and say, and the mayor, I mean, what are you guys doing? So anyway, right. I just wanted to make that clear. Sorry. <laughs> okay. okay. Board Member Louis Kwan. Thank you. Um, Brennan, I, I wanted to say uh, two things. One is um, <clears throat> I noticed, I, I, I reviewed all that information um, that was submitted to the Star Advertiser um, at their request, you know, all the communications, the information, you know, with respect to um, um, the relationship between HECO and, and, and HART. And um, um, two comments with respect to that. One is that um, I got the clear impression that the establishment of the task force was very helpful and you're leading the task force. I got the sense it was making very good progress. So I want to thank you for that. The second observation I had was that starting with that letter from HECO on March 8, 2013, um, all the way up to the present time, um, those letters were written by engineers at HECO, but they, they were very absolutely clear to me they were written by lawyers from HECO. Um, and, and so it's almost like the watermark was legal department uh, from HECO. Um, it's just, um, and so uh, what they were doing is they realized back in 2009 when you had that early um, email communication from, from their staff, that you know, that, you know, wasn't like it is today, but starting with that, maybe a little bit earlier, right around March 8, 2013, the whole tone was, this is a um, uh, uh, a matter of um, protecting ourselves legally from liability, and um, also maybe for for public consumption purposes, and so those letters were really, as I said, they're written. They're signed by the, by the engineers at HECO, but they're clearly written by lawyers. And so um, my, this is something that I, I've suggested in, in one of our permitted interaction group meetings dealing with the, the financial plan refresh, is that I, I think it's really important um, as you move forward, and there's no, no, there's no um, good time to start except at the present, but I really think we've got great lawyers at heart you should engage them to help you, you know, as you write these letters. Uh, the letters that came from Hart to HECO were, were signed by engineers and they were written by engineers, um, which I guess is okay, but it's important for, as we, you know, you, um, you're having these relationships um, that the, um, that, you know, your positions are clearly 
structured and defined in a way that presents your position um, that, that it gives the optimum, optimum amount of protection to our organization. So that's my, 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 my recommendation. Point well taken. Well, Brennan, I have uh, just following up, I guess, on, on Board Member Hanabusa's question. And, and so I understand that, that in many projects, maybe these design considerations would not be discussed at the board level. But I think the difference here is that up until this point, this last PMOC, we weren't carrying sufficient contingency or worst case scenario estimates to prepare us for what we actually ran up against. Correct. And, and that's what none of us want to do that going forward. I mean, whenever we come up with our number, we want to know that if we're able to get the revenue to meet that number, we're going to have a full project build out. So I think that's key. But one of the other things that, that I noticed in reviewing these letters is, is that uh, the early ones, like 2008, 2009, I think two of those individuals were on the letter to Darren Marr in 2013, copied to him. Were any of those individuals still in the Hart organization in 2013? Because I'm wondering if there was corporate knowledge in, in the agency. Because one thing that really, to me, hasn't changed by HECO is the 30, 40, and the 50, the clearances. They've been consistent from 2008 until today. Maybe sequencing was different, and allowing you to look at equipment options is different, but those three clearance numbers have really not changed. So, um, you know, it, it, when, the, when the letters came out in the Star Advertiser, it really begged the question of what happened to the corporate knowledge of these individuals early on, and I know the one guy said, don't discuss this or don't show it to HECO. I understand that. And I think that was very unfortunate. But within your organization, was there collective knowledge that, in fact, HECO was from the beginning at 30, 40, 50? I, I'm not aware of, of anyone who is still on staff that was around during that time. Okay. So, so I think it's good that, that we're learning here and, and applying the knowledge moving forward. Uh, the one thing I, I did wanted to ask you about, because for me it's educational, I know we've talked about there's a confidentiality agreement between Hart and HECO that starts in 2012. And for a Sunshine Board, the fact that staff has a confidentiality agreement with a third party that's a part of our project means that it's something that we really can't get into. So why, if you could explain to the board and to the, to the public, why do you have a confidentiality agreement with HECO? I, I can't answer that right now. I'd have to, I, I'd have to kind of look into more of, of the history of the confident, confidentiality agreement. Yeah, so if you could, I think that's a good thing to inform <laughs> us because it helps us understand why there are areas in a relationship with the utility that we can't ask questions because, frankly, we, we can't discuss it in public. Sure. I mean, to me, there's got to be a reason for it. So I would sure. like to know what that is. Okay, fair and enough. Then, and then the last thing, I know we learned a lot of lessons on the west side on traffic mitigation and business mitigation. And so can you explain to the board and to the public how we're going to do a better job on the east side? Well, I think, I mean, the most obvious, I think, is just making sure that we are out a lot further in front than we were on the west. I think the notification, the, the, the ad, amount of time given in terms of advance notification was not advanced enough uh, to allow people to plan appropriately. Um, I think the amount of engagement uh, with the businesses started far too late in terms of the level of detail of engagement that, we, that we're into now. I think that should have been done far sooner, uh, which is what we're trying to do now on the east side. Um, <clears throat> letting people know uh, through public meetings, um, you know, we held one at Kalihikai Elementary, that was our first major one. Uh, that was intended to kind of just get information out there, let people, uh, let them know that they need to start becoming aware and educated on what is going to be coming their way. And, and in order to do that, trying to do some of these public meetings, uh, especially some of these presentations we're doing to the board, uh, to give people a better sense, visual sense of, of what kind of construction activities that they can expect to be coming because we've already seen it happen. Um, there's a lot of... Uh, research going on with some of the businesses on the west side in terms of what would they have done differently and I think uh, a lot of them have indicated that they would have they didn't think that it was going to be as bad as it was uh, 
And so when it was as bad as it was, they weren't ready, so they would have planned differently. And I think sharing some of those uh, experiences, having some of the people on the West share it with those on the East when we have some of our, our regular business meetings uh, is going to be vital in terms of some of the credibility of what people need to prepare for. So I, I, I think uh, I think that that alone is is going to play a much bigger difference on the east side than it than, than it did on the west because I think we're we're getting out as much as possible now as as compared to the west. I don't th I don't think we were out enough on the west. Okay, well, I appreciate that honesty. Board members, any other questions? I just got one a suggestion on that business mitigations and, and stuff out on the east, east portion of it. Uh, unlike the west, I think the west pretty much is that just that main corridor you had all these businesses. But on you know when you start heading down Dillingham, you got the streets behind Dillingham yep. that also might be effective. Are you guys planning to reach out to them as well too? Yes. Okay. We we look out um, a few blocks okay. from the corridor, and we did that on the on the west side as well. But again kind of too late in the game. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, board member Hanabusa. Brennan, um, <clears throat> given our governance structure <laughs> and the fact that you are now the acting executive director, I would like to formally request that you task our corporation councils with the issue that um, Chair Formby raised. Sure. And, um, you know, technically it has to be by you uh, as the acting executive director to task them with that, because it is a critical issue on Sunshine and and also just issues as to whether or not governmental entities can enter into those kinds of confidential agreements. Notwithstanding the structure of HART, you're st we're still an agency of the sitting county of, of Honolulu. So that's a, that's a specific request. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? So there's no action items on the agenda tonight. Board members, is there any reason for us to go into executive session? I don't believe so. Okay, seeing none, I did want to wrap this up by thanking MOCA again for making the facility available, Olelo for the, the filming tonight, uh, Hart to all the staff coming out and supporting us in this evening meeting. Is there anybody else that? You have two testifiers that want to come up now? Okay, can we get the names? Okay, so board, if you don't mind, we'll listen to, the first is David. David, if you can come up and state your full name. Zevenberger, David Zevenberger. Yes, sir. You want to come up to the microphone so they can hear you at home? My name is David Zevenbergen. I reside at 94287 Kikiula Loop, Mililani. And I'm here tonight for the information that was presented. And my questions have been answered uh, more than I actually expected. So I'm very happy with what I heard tonight. Thank well, thank you, you for coming. And I thank appreciate you. that comment. And next we have Thomas Beck. Is Thomas Beck here? There he is. Good evening, board. My name is Thomas Beck. Um, initially, I've been a, a strong backer of this because I thought it was going to um, uh, make a huge impact in regards to traffic and everything else. But as it changed, I had some concerns. And I believe the two of the board members brought up the uh, same concerns I had. Why not Nimitz? Um, Again, I don't know uh, in regards to utilities, what's under there. It could be just as bad as, uh, as uh, going on Dillingham. But uh, as anybody knows who lives in Kali, I lived in Kali over almost 60 years. Uh, if you block one lane on Dillingham going either way, it's either going to, if it's coming from the west, it'll go to the freeway. If you block it going, coming from town, it'll go into town. If you're going to block two lanes, I don't know what it's going to do. We do have um, 
large companies like Costco, which is number one in the nation. I don't know how it's going to affect them. Uh, we have Home Depot and many other. And um, my biggest concern is what happened uh, in the West in regards to some companies uh, actually closing up. Um, I have friends who have businesses down there and they lost business. I'm not sure if it has recovered. And uh, I did bring up a question in the last board meeting um, in regards to how much the city lost in revenue and taxes. And my concern is I'm pretty much worried what's going to do uh, for the Kali area. And, but all my other questions have been answered. Uh, and getting back to what um, uh, board member uh, Hong had talked about, my parents said the same thing, that they enjoyed taking the train all the way to one eye because of where it went. I can't see why they can't go on limits. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Beck. Is there anybody else that would like to testify? Yes, sir. Board members, I'm Cruz Vina from the Pro City. And I think uh, the outreach program that Hart is doing right now, because I attend both of them at White Paho and at Pro City. And we need to do more along the Dillingham Corridor. As a person who was born and raised there, I played from Hall, uh, Hall Street all the way to Middle Street, and from Ivale all the way up to Punoy. <clears throat> and thank God, at least we have other roads we can use, which is, again, King Street, Limits, School Street, and H1. In Pro City, you only had H1 and Manolo Road. So at least we have some leeway when the construction along Dillingham takes, takes roots. And I'd like to thank the Hart Board for getting out to the community, which they did need to do more often on the Dillingham Corridor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vina. By the way, Mr. Vina is on the City's Transportation Commission, and we appreciate his service. Anybody else that wants to testify? Okay, seeing none and seeing no other board business, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>